Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Good day, everyone. This week's parsha of Et Hanan contains within it the two pillars of Jewish faith, the uh, Aseret Advarim, the Ten Commandments, so to speak, Mamed Har Sinai, the revelation at Sinai, that's one pillar, that's the basic moral and halachic pillar, not only of Judaism, but of all of civilization. The Ramban says that all of the 613 mitzvot can be derived from the Ten Commandments that were issued at Sinai. So that's a basis for us. <clears throat> it's uh, one of the most important pillars of our faith. The second one is that in the Parsha, the, the Torah records for us, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echod, and the Parsha of the Ohavtos Hashem Elokecho which is also a basic pillar the, and it's uh, it's the introduction of Jews to the world and it's the departure point of Jews from the world. It's the ultimate statement of faith and veracity. So I want to, for the uh, few moments that we have together, discuss uh, this uh, second pillar with you. The first pillar I discussed in Shul somewhat uh, between Menchemayev earlier this week. But the second one of Shema Yisrael I want to discuss today with you. What's the origin of Shema Yisrael? Well, I mean, it's a person in the Torah. It's here in the Parsha. But the Medrash teaches us that it's much more ancient than that, so to speak. That this was the verse that was recited uh, when uh, Yaakov Avinu, our father Yaakov, gathered his sons to bless them. And that uh, they reassured him in advance, Shema Yisrael, listen to us. Our father Israel, so here Israel means Yaakov, because that was the name that he, the Lord called him. Hashem Elokeinu, the Lord Hashem, who is your God, Elokeinu, he's our God as well. You should know that we're loyal. Hashem Echod. Uh, so here, uh, Echod has also nuances. Echod means one. In other words, we and you are one in our worship and understanding of God. So we understand Hashem the same way. And also Hashem Echod, the Rabboni Sholem has a unity, so to speak, to him, which is unmatched by any other unity in creation. It's a uniqueness. It's a one. Uh, we have no word to express it. So echad here is not like echad shtayim shalosh, one, two, three, which is a number. Echad here is a description of a unity that exists because in the ancient world and even in today's world, uh, we like to fragment uh, God. And uh, the whole basis of, of Avodah Zorah was that there were gods for different occurrences in nature. And there were gods for different nations and gods for different societies and gods for different circumstances. And so uh, the, the Shvatim came and said, no, Hashem Echot, the same God throughout everything no matter what happens. 
and we can in the uh, ancient world and in the modern world too. You know, there are gods that are benign and charitable, and there are gods that are evil and vengeful. And all of that is a diminution of the idea of echot. We, uh, the, the Novi Yirmiya will say in Eicha, Ki Mashem lo seitze oro svatovos. Is it not from God that everything emanates? And even what we consider to be harmful or punishing or negative, just like things that are beneficial and blessing to us, it all emanates kaviyochel from the Rabboni Shalom and from God, and that's the idea of Hashem Echod. So that was the origin of it. Now Moshe repeats it as a posseg in the Torah, and here it has a far broader meaning. Shema Yisrael, we're not talking to Yaakov Avinu alone, but we're talking to all of the Jewish people. Because our name is called upon the name of Yaakov. We're called Yisrael. The state of Israel is called Israel. That's our general name. The land is called the land of Israel. The Torah is the Torah of Israel. So Shema Yisrael. Now what does it mean Shema? Here it means it's a, it's a commandment. The Jewish people have to hear this. And Shema means, in Yiddish they used to say, there is Heron and their Heron. Heron means to hear. Their Heron means really to hear, to get it. Shema is their Heron. It's not just to hear the words, but it is to understand and appreciate and analyze what is being said. And uh, that's why in the second uh, paragraph in Parsha's Hekeb we'll read, If you'll really understand what I'm selling you, so you'll see that there'll be blessings. And that's why it says in Lotishmu. Lotishmu doesn't mean you didn't hear, you heard it. You couldn't avoid hearing it because it made noise. But you didn't understand what it was said. You didn't take it to heart. You didn't think about it. You didn't analyze it. And if it's only a question of hearing, so then. Uh, it can't be of any value. I remember uh, when I was in law school, I had a professor uh, who was uh, hard of hearing. And he had a, a hearing aid device. In those days, they were very bulky. Not only just in the ear, but he had to carry a, uh, in his pocket uh, a large uh, amplifier. And I remember that uh, if a student asked a question which he deemed to be either uh, stupid, unnecessary, or impertinent, he would make a show of turning off his hearing aid. You don't want to hear it. But that doesn't work. So the question of Shema, of hearing here, is really to hear. Hear Israel. The Jewish people should really hear, get it. What should they hear? Hashem Elokeinu, the Lord is our God, right? That there's a God in the world, and he controls everything, and he's the God of all of us, and he's universal. 
and we acknowledge, we are uh, proud of the fact that we can say, Hashem Elokeinu. And Hashem Echod, again, refers to the unity because there was a lot of imperfect monotheism that exists in the world. One of the great objections of Judaism to Christianity, why many of the Rishonim didn't hold it to be uh, really acceptable in any form, because it, uh, it had the concept of the Trinity, it had the concept of divi dividing God, so to speak. Hashem Echod. And from there, there came the custom, the Gomorrah mentions already, Ma'arichin, with the uh, Echod. Uh, we stretch out the word. We want to emphasize it. Now, you're supposed to be marich with the Dalit. So the question arises, how can you be marich with the Dalit? And it's a duh sound, that's all you can say. So Shlomo Ibn Gabiru and other Rishonim say that the Dalit should not be pronounced the way it is in the regular Ashkenazic dialect. It's just plain duh. But rather, it should be, he said, kishira sadvorim, like the buzz of the bees. It should be dzz. And if it's like dzz, then we can understand how we can stretch it, because we can make a longer buzz. And therefore, in Lithuania, there was a tradition and uh, I'm somewhat partial to that tradition, that when we say Hashem Echod, so we say Echodz. We put uh, the, the uh, buzz at the end in order to fulfill the idea that's mentioned in the Gemara, that one should be Marich. Now, most people are Marich in the, in the uh, Ches, and the echod, and some people make a very hard dalid da. So uh, I'm not one to decide, uh, put my head between these giants. But uh, the emphasis on echod is necessary because of the fact that Imperfect monotheism leads to uh, all sorts of problems, not just theological problems, practical problems. Because then the, we uh, don't have a correct understanding of God. And uh, we are ascribing to God, so to speak, human characteristics, which is really blasphemy, which is really... Uh, heresy, things that we should not be done at all. So we can't think of God as a nice old man with a white beard sitting on a chair. But rather we have to uh, be sophisticated enough and uh, clever enough to realize that the uniqueness Echod is like no other uniqueness that we are able to compare it to. Now, when we recite Kriya Shema, we then say a posseg, Boruch Shem Kvod Malchus Ola Olam Voed. That posseg was recited in the Beis Amigdash instead of Omen. In other words, when the brocha was made in the Beis Hamikdash, the kohol, the congregation, did not respond to Omen the way we do, but they responded, Boruch Shein Kod Malchus Olam Voyed. And we have the vestige of this in our uh, Musaf Davning 
the Avoda section, when we recall the service of the Kohen Gadol in the Beis Amikdash. So it said that he used to say the Shem Amaforosh, the ineffable name of God, and the people, when they heard it, bowed and prostrated themselves and answered, Boruch Shein Kod Malchus Olam Where does this come from? It's not written in the Torah. So again, we have to go back to Yaakov Avinu. The Medrash tells us that when his son said to him, Shema Yisrael Hashem Alakeinu Hashem Echod, he responded, Boruch Shem Kod Malchus Olam So this is a verse, a sentence from our father Yaakov in response to Shema Yisrael. So the commentators point out, so that left us in a quandary. How could we say it when the Torah did not say it? It's not written in the Torah. How could we not say it if our father Yaakov said it? And there were And that's the halacha, that we say it silently. When we finish saying Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem Echod, we then say Boruch Shein Kvod Malchus Olam Voed silently to ourselves. The exception to that is on Yom Kippurim, when we say it loudly, when we proclaim Boruch Shein, because that is like a Zecher Lamigdash. That is a reconstruction of what happened in the temple. In the temple, they said, Baruch Shein Vod Malchus Olam Voed out loud because that was the uh, Omein that was used. So on Yom Kippur, when we recall the service of the Kohen Gadol in the temple, etc., so there we say it out loud. But otherwise, the rest of the year, we say it silently because it's written in the Torah, so we can say it out loud. On the other hand, we can't ignore it completely because our father Yaakov said it. So let's just advance a little to the Parsha of the Ahavtos Hashem Okech. How can one command love? You love God. Yeah, you can't. Uh, love is an emotion. And it's not uh, easily subject to uh, command. You can't command A to love B. You can't command uh, Anyone to love because it's an emotion. The Torah never demands most things that are impossible, that are beyond the simple ability of human beings to accomplish. The Torah is not given to angels, it's given to human beings. Therefore, everything that's given is an understanding of the limitations of human beings. So there are those that say, well, that's a goal. You will come to love God. Okay, so then uh, that can make perfect uh, sense to us that if we spend a lifetime studying Torah, doing mitzvahs, being a moral person, helping others, so we come to a love of God because we realize that we're doing God's work, we're accomplishing God's mission, so to speak, and therefore we have a relationship with the Creator. And once we feel we have a relationship with Him, it can develop.
happened to love. We know that uh, with human beings as well. There are people that we don't love immediately, but somehow we develop a relationship. Anytime we urge that we learn to love people. Many times it's true in a family with children, and grandchildren, etc. So too it is with us with the Rabboni Shalom. Say that the Havta, that the Rabboni is going to teach us how to love him. How do we express love? That's a, that's a problem that exists, right? Can't walk around all day saying to your wife, you know, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. After a while, she'll tell you to keep quiet. How do you express that love? It's not through words. The words are important. The words can be an expression of love. But love is expressed through behavior through action, through consideration. You see that I love this person the way I treat this person. I'm always looking to make that person happier, safer, more secure by gift for this person. One of my great experiences here in Israel, over the years, I always used to buy a gift for my wife for Pesach. I was, uh, for a long time, I thought that I knew and had good taste in jewelry. So there was a store that I went to here so it's not one of the fancy stores. It's not H. Stern and Company. So I have a customer there as well. But the store is like a hole in the ground in, uh, off of Light Street in Jerusalem. Only uh, Amalco, I believe. And I was always amazed because I went there like four days before Pesach, four days before. The number of people that came to buy jewelry and were obviously buying for their wives, sometimes for their daughters. And the owner of the store, who was a very clever and wise Jew, really was the, the he had geschmack to him. From Jew, from Jew. He used to say, they're not from jewelry. I'm not selling them jewelry. I'm selling them love. He hit the nail on the head. That's what he was doing. There was no way to express it, so you express it in a necklace. But it's not the necklace. It's the that permits it that motivated it, that brought it about. So we have to us, Hashem Elokecho B'chol Levovecho. What's Levovecho? Your heart. A heart is desire. A heart is what our vision is, what we want to be. And uh, so... Love is a desire to please the other person. That's what I want to do. So I want to please God, so to speak. God doesn't need my pleasure. He doesn't need to do anything for him. But the expression of the love of God is through my heart. That's my emotion, what I want to do for him. Oh, the mitzvah. 
that a mitzvah isn't for me, mitzvah isn't for Ramshon, mitzvah is the will to do something for God. And that's why the the Pirkei Ovis, it says, L'vichach Hebrelem Torah Mitzvahs. What HaKodesh Baruch is HaKodesh Israel. Bonesham wanted to give us an opportunity to show a concern for it. He gave us a lot of mitzvahs. There are myriad ways to do it. And then there's Bechon Nafshech. The Gemara says, I feel no tell us Nafshech. So we know that the Halacha, there are uh, three Averas that are Yaharog Val Yavor. Uh, that uh, one has to allow oneself to be killed rather than transgress. Avoda uh, Zoro, bound to idols. Now, Zora comes in various forms and shapes. It's very sophisticated. So uh, nobody's going to bow down to it, uh, an idol today, right? We, we don't, uh, that's, uh, we're not tempted by that. There's plenty of Zora that does tempt us. And then there's Shikha's Domi murder. You kill this person, or I'll kill you. And we see that in a world of uh, infanticide, in a world where life means very little. And we'll force you to do it. You'll have to pay for it. You'll have to support it. You have to be part of it. These are all very serious issues. They all strike at the heart of what we believe. And there was a case now in the Supreme Court in the United States that was decided on behalf of a Catholic uh, order of nuns that they refused to pay for abortion uh, procedures, uh, medical insurance for people that worked for them. People that worked for them, if they wanted to take out such insurance, nobody could stop them. But the, the order of uh, sisters said, no, we're not gonna pay for it. It's against our religion. And naturally this was, it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court narrowly decided that they don't have to pay for it. But if one has changed his mind or her mind, so then they, they're making you kill somebody. You have no choice in the matter. And in effect, that's uh, in a wider sense, and I don't mean an exact comparison, God, God, for a wider sense, that was women's defense. I only followed order. You told me to kill, so I killed. Why different than a soldier? So, the whole nafshecha includes that thin line of human life, which is not a simple matter. And I'm not thinking that those terms, but that it is here. And then the, the, the Pesach says, Bechol Meodecha. Meodecha means your wealth, your possessions, your property. So the Gemara raises the question, we already said that you have to give up your life, so then what do you have to say, your property? So the Gemara says, Yesh there are people, Shem Amonam Chaviv Aleihem, 
their wealth and property is more dear to them than their lives. And we say it in Davni, Banafsho Yovi Lachmo. We bring our bread by risking our lives. How many professions are there in the world that risk lives? Often uh, uh, think, uh, you know, there in the United States, one of the most uh, popular professional sports is professional football which is absolute murder, mayhem. And there are, uh, there have been hundreds, if not thousands of players that have suffered permanent injury, paralysis, concussions, dementia. Now, why should a person do that? Why should he risk it? Well, one of the reasons is because they're all young, they start, you're young and destructive. Don't think of those consequences. But a second reason is because you get paid millions of dollars for doing it. And you know, so therefore I'll take the risk of uh, permanent brain damage or God forbid paralysis, because I'll get $5 million this year. So yesh lecha adon, the Gemara says, shemomon lechovi v'olov yoser migufo. It's not a strange aberration. They're, every day people risk their lives in order to have wealth or property. So the Torah says that's one of the methods of love of God. How do you treat your wealth? What do you do with it? Does that become God himself? To many people it is. I mean, if you've got billions of dollars, why do you need more billions of dollars? But that's our nature. Mishi Eishlo Mona wrote some Messiah. If you have 100, you want 200. If you have 100 million, you want 200 million. If you have 100 billion, you want 200 billion. Even though you can't do anything with it. It's the story of Midas, King Midas. He got all the gold in the world and he got nothing to eat. So what? So how do you treat your wealth? Do you put it to good purpose? Do you share it with others? Do you help build with it? That's a good question. And that is a visible expression of how the Haftas Hashem If you love the Lord your God, then let's see how you behave regarding your wealth, your possessions, whatever you have. Many years ago, I, uh, when I was a rabbi in Miami Beach, I would go a few times a week with the Ponevizhirov to collect money for his yeshiva. I was his driver. But one of the greatest honors of my life. He used to say every morning to me, when we get in the car, he would look at his list and he'd say, now let us see with whom we can do a favor today. And he really believed it. He was doing them a favor because as they were going now to contribute to Torah, to the land of Israel, to the rebuilding of the Jewish people, 
What greater favor could you do to a person? When you write a check, you always feel that you're doing the favor. But after Hashem Alokecha, Bechol Avovechol, Nam Shechol Medecha, it teaches us that you're not doing any favors. That's what brings you to love. That would bring you to this uh, status of being an Oev Hashem. And therefore, that I, this is one of the pillars of Judaism. These simple verses. Teach your children. Shinantam is over and over again. Teach your children Torah. And Torah is good everywhere. Wherever you go, there's Torah. You light God's name on your house. You do that as an expression of love. Many times people put a template on the door and it says, uh, you know, uh, 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 whatever name and whatever the wife's name is, that's their house. When you put a mezuzah out, you're saying it's God's house. That's who we love. That's why the name is there. All of this lies in this week's parsha, which is so uh, fruitful and full of major ideas. So I want to wish you all uh, well over the fast and uh, have a great Shabbat. And uh, we'll hear good from each other. Please stay healthy and well. Thank you again.